heartbreak, romance, affairs, secrets, rivalries, twists and turns, family, and drama. These are all the makings of a soap opera. Whether you love them or don't care about them, they've been around for as long as TV has been around and they are still running to this day. Also known as the stories, these TV programs had our moms, aunties, and grandmas in a chokehold. What once rained daytime TV has gradually fallen to a handful of programs that are still on the air. How did soaps come to be? What made them so big? Why does it seem like the soap opera has fallen? In this video, we'll dig deep into finding the answers to these questions. Soap operas have been accused of being programs with overacting only designed to sell products of the advertisers, not caring about telling good stories. It's been told to be seen as shows to just kill time and that they are really unnecessary due to the rise of reality TV. The thing is that Erna would disagree with you. Who's Erna though? By Erna, I mean Erna Phillips former teacher and actress, the creator of the soap opera genre. And it goes back all the way to when radios were the only source of entertainment in one's household. Erna Phillips was inspired by the serialized storytelling of Charles Dickens. She created the first soap opera, Painted Dreams, inspired by Erna's own hardships and the hardships of her family. Erna would end each episode with a cliffhanger in order to hook the listeners and get them tuning in every day, five days a week to be specific. Pretty much creating the original binge watch when soaps landed on TV. But in this case, it was the original binge listen. Erna would go on to create the classic soap opera, The Guiding Light, which started on radio and eventually ended up on TV running for a total of 72 years, making it the longest scripted show in US history. She would go on to create other classic soap operas, like As the World Turns, which ran for 54 years, and Another World, which ran for 35. In her serialized dramas, she would center these shows around a family led by matriarchs and patriarchs and create conflicts for them to endure day in and day out. She wanted these storylines to be character driven and family oriented, not focused on one main character. It was important to Erna that the audience care and relate to these characters. These shows were an ensemble, dependent on family and community. The conflicts that these families faced was her way of mirroring real life because real life is honestly full of struggle. In reality, these early dramas opened the door to the serialized programs that we see today. Like I mentioned, Erna wanted her shows to mirror real life. These characters were so real to her, she was extremely critical of the actors who played them. She wouldn't even call the actors by their names, but by their characters' names. Let's dig deep into how the soaps landed on TV. Erna knew that TV was the future and created a soap opera called These Are My Children, but that didn't work out. Search for Tomorrow, which was not created by Erna Phillips, was actually the first soap to find success on television. Then The Guiding Light would follow. Before we go further, let's discuss how soap operas were actually called soap operas. These dramas were used as a way to sell soap to stay at home housewives. The housewives would listen to these dramas then when the commercials would play, they would find out what sort of soap products would be best for their household. This really is the reason why certain soaps have lasted for 50, 60, and 70 years. Soaps were supposed to go on as long as they could in order to help sell these products. These shows made huge money for the networks and advertisers, but I'll discuss that a bit more in depth later on. But in order for these shows to remain on for decades, these soaps had to remain engaging by creating engaging characters and storylines. Like I mentioned before, the storylines were character driven, but what would keep the audience coming back were the characters they were familiar with, also known as the tent pole characters. These sort of characters were to stay on the show until their death or until the show's death. In order for the soaps to remain on air for decades, there had to be this cycle. Someone would watch the show, 
wanting to escape their own issues and watch someone else suffer. But since they were watching the show, they would watch with their child. Then when their child would grow up, they would watch with their child. But let's say that someone down the family line stopped watching the soap for years, but decided to check it out after not watching for so long. What will hook them are the characters they grew up with because they were so familiar with them. Almost like these characters were a part of the viewer's family since they saw them every Monday through Friday with no season finales. In order for the soaps to survive, they needed to connect the viewer because writing for someone else like network executives only meant disaster. We'll also discuss that a bit later on. The thing was that Erna was focused on how to secure these shows future and she would teach those younger than her how to structure these shows. Agnes Nixon, creator of All My Children and One Life to Live, and William J. Bell, who created Young and the Restless and Bold and the Beautiful, were Erna's students who literally perfected the skill of running soap operas. As TV was growing popular, the soaps were growing popular. They were really getting big in the 60s and were huge throughout the 80s, making the advertisers and networks big bucks. Honestly, soap operas used to be the main source of income for the TV networks. Since soap operas were getting so big, if an actor wanted to land it big in show business, it was advised that they start on a soap opera, making it an important starting ground for many talented, popular stars. So we get that the soap started becoming popular since the viewers are able to relate to the characters. In order to relate to the viewers on a deep level, the soaps would tackle social issues such as generational conflicts. These sort of conflicts acknowledge the perspective of the older generation instead of demonizing them or ignoring their worldview. The storylines also encouraged the older generation to see where the youth was coming from, like whether the Vietnam War was necessary or what would be the right decision to make when it came to an unwanted, unplanned pregnancy. Race issues were discussed on the soaps and this was very important to Agnes Nixon since she had this deep desire to integrate the shows, adding interracial relationships and accepting the way that God made you. Characters would face the hardships of cancer, HIV AIDS, assault, prostitution, domestic violence, and even mental illness. Since the soaps aired five days a week, it gave the viewers a chance to see how these issues affected characters on a deeper level. By the 80s, soaps began to kind of shift from the realism of the 60s and 70s. Even though the soaps were always seen as a form of escapism for the viewers, it really became more fantasy-like, not only captivating housewives, but their husbands and their children. Characters were looking and becoming more wealthy. They began going on these adventures, but these adventurous storylines would revolve around a certain super couple. Now, I can't discuss super couples without discussing Luke and Laura, who were on General Hospital. Before Luke and Laura, there were popular couples. Penny and Jeff from As The World Turns were unofficially the first super couple, but not as huge as Luke and Laura. Luke and Laura pretty much became big when they went on the run from mobsters in their summer storyline. During the summer, teens and college students were on break from school where they were able to watch the soaps every day. Since the soaps were trying to reach the younger audience, the summer storylines had to be huge. Luke and Laura would continue to grow even more popular with the Ice Princess storyline where Mikos Cassidyne tried to freeze the entire world but Luke and Laura were able to stop the madman's plans of world domination. Clearly, soaps were shifting away from their realistic roots, but viewers were captivated by the storyline in the 80s and ate it up. In my opinion, I feel like the Ice Princess storyline 
influence soaps to get a bit bonkers with storylines such as time traveling, vampires, underground cities, aliens, clones, demon possession. Let's not dwell on all that. Luke and Lara were bringing General Hospital huge numbers, leading them to be the number one soap opera on daytime TV. When Luke and Lara got married, it was must-see TV, gaining General Hospital 30 million viewers that day, the most viewed soap opera episode in American history. Even though Luke and Lara were this huge super couple, they really didn't become popular until Luke assaulted Lara. You heard me right. Luke was only supposed to be on General Hospital for a short time, but after he assaulted Lara, the viewers wanted to see more of him. It seemed like the assault on Lara was supposed to be a current event issue sort of storyline, but Gloria Monty, who was the executive producer of General Hospital at the time, pretty much played it off like it wasn't assault and that Luke quote unquote seduced Lara, but that's not the sort of stuff you'd get away with in this day and age. Plenty of viewers weren't buying the whole seduce excuse, such as Michelle Valjean, who would later write for General Hospital. Unfortunately, Michelle Valjean had her trauma when it came to assault and knew that Lara was not seduced at all. In the late 90s, almost 20 years after the assault, the character of Elizabeth Weber was assaulted, opening the door for Laura to finally confront Luke for what he did to her all of those years ago. But let's get back to the more lighthearted, amazing parts of the 80s. Since soaps were huge back then, there would be huge soap festivals. The popularity of daytime soaps influenced prime time to create classic soaps of their own, such as Dallas, Dynasty, Falcon's Crest, and Knott's Landing. What I never realized were that ratings actually began to dip later on in the 80s, but they were still pretty strong in that decade through the 90s. But a specific event in the summer of 1994 truly impacted the soaps and not in a good way. OJ Simpson, along with his friend Al Cowlings, were on a speed chase since OJ was accused of taking the lives of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. Now, I wasn't around when all this went down. I would only show up in the world a few years later, but what I do know was that the OJ trial was enormous. His case was like a real life soap opera, proving that real life is stranger and can even be more interesting than fiction. Because of this case, it caused constant preemption for the soaps. The internet wasn't really like it is now where the networks could just upload the episodes onto their websites, so viewers were unsure of whether their soaps would be on that day, causing there to be a decline in the ratings. After OJ was found not guilty, it seemed like the networks had no desire to bring those ratings up, especially since soaps weren't as profitable as they were back in the 80s. On top of that, their main targets, who were women, were declining due to the lack of stay-at-home housewives and the increase of working women. The sad thing is that OJ and working women were not the only reason for the soaps declining viewership. Remember, in order for the soaps to remain on air, the stories surrounding the characters the viewers cared about needed to remain compelling. Soap fans are loyal. But why test someone's loyalty? Sure, there was the channel SoapNet, which launched in 2000 but ended in 2012, where working women could watch reruns of their favorite soaps at night, but it was still the soap's responsibility to remain watchable. There are plenty of different people to blame for the lackluster storylines that dug the graves of many soap operas. One are the hack writers who wrote off core characters which the audience loved, even writing pointless storylines which didn't give viewers any real payoff. The late Douglas Marland, who was critically acclaimed for his storytelling in the soaps he wrote, literally made a step-by-step -step guide on how not to 
run a soap into the ground. Soap writers were to learn the show's history, to be objective by putting their own personal likes and dislikes aside in order to make good character development. The core characters should not have been acting out of character. New characters were to be built slowly and not shoved into the viewers' faces. And it was vital to listen to the viewers' concerns about the shows they grew up watching. It was like when Douglas Marlin passed away, writers and executives shoved this advice out of the way. As for the executives, the soaps were plagued with greedy, know-it-all executives who didn't want to invest in the soaps. Instead of hiring new writers with fresh, new, relevant ideas, they would recycle older head writers from different soaps over and over again. Though it is true that certain soaps have come and gone, it seemed like by the late 90s, the networks weren't concerned about keeping soaps relevant anymore. By 1999, classic soap opera Another World was cancelled and replaced with the soap opera Passions, which was really like a fantasy soap like Dark Shadows was back in the 60s. No matter how insane Passions was, it grew a huge audience and was big with teens back in the late 90s throughout the 2000s. Passions was cancelled by 2008 and there have been no new daytime soap operas ever since. After the cancellation of Passions, the youngest soap opera, this pretty much gave networks the open door to be done with daytime soap operas altogether. Procter & Gamble, who own soaps like Guiding Light and As World Turns, soaps created by the soap creator Erna Phillips, decided that they were done with the soap business. Not their soap products, I still see Dawn soap all over the place. No, they were done with their serialized dramas, canceling Guiding Light in 2009 and As World Turns in 2010. Here's the thing, I didn't grow up with the CBS soaps. My earliest memories are with the ABC soaps like All My Children, One Life to Live, and General Hospital. Talking about the end of All My Children and One Life to Live is the one that's gonna hurt most. For a few years before its cancellation, there were rumors of All My Children getting canceled, but the network was like, no way, All My Children is safe where it's at. In late 2009, production moved from New York all the way to Los Angeles, which felt like a weird random move, but hey, why ask a bunch of actors and crew members to move to a completely different state if the network wasn't investing in the show? On top of that, Lorraine Broderick, who wrote storylines which were well received by the All My Children fans, was brought back as head writer to see if the show could be brought back to its former glory. But looking back at it now, it seems like Lorraine was brought on to give All My Children a proper send-off because ABC was like, Yeah, the rumors were true. We want to cancel All My Children, and they did cancel All My Children. Of course, this was a total shock to those working on the show, but of course it was a shock to the loyal fans of 41 years. That's not even the worst part. One Life to Live would also get canceled the same exact day. Now you may be asking, what did ABC plan to replace these classic shows with? A cooking show called The Chew and the short-lived weight loss show called The Revolution. Do you want to know why? Because women supposedly had no desire to escape the real world and only wanted information. It's not like women watch the mess of Real Housewives and Love and Hip Hop at all. As for the younger viewers, like teens and young adults, they were watching messy drama like the ones on Jersey Shore and Degrassi. On top of that, ABC said that the ratings were getting lower and lower. Maybe for All My Children, but when All My Children aired its last episode, it was the number two soap. Does that mean that for the past decade, they should have invested in their show and make it watchable so that the ratings wouldn't have been dropped in the first place? On top of that, I don't understand why ABC just couldn't count the soap net viewership 
or advertise their soaps properly. Was One Life to Live falling in the ratings too? No, it wasn't. It was actually the top rated soap on ABC. One Life to Live was consistently growing in the ratings, but ABC canceled it anyways in the sake of creating informative reality TV that nobody wanted to watch. Here I am in my early teens in the early 2010s crying like a baby because the shows that were around when I was a baby were no longer on air. Until All My Children and One Life to Live had a short revival online by a company called Prospect Park who didn't really know what they were doing and broke the fans hearts by canceling it again. My guess is that suing ABC for using One Life to Live characters on General Hospital might have hurt Prospect Park's pockets, but instead of chasing ABC's money, maybe Prospect Park could have focused on making compelling drama that had the potential to reach a new, wider audience. Instead, they decided to just be a bit too edgy with their soaps, especially One Life to Live. I didn't really have many complaints with All My Children to be honest, but it was edgy to the point where things were getting a bit cringy. Once again, I'm crying like a baby because All My Children and One Life to Live are gone. General Hospital seemed to be in good hands after All My Children and One Life to Live were cancelled on ABC. It seems like the network was extremely hesitant to cancel General Hospital because the fans were heated when All My Children and One Life to Live were taken off the air. But though General Hospital is still on the air and became enjoyable to watch, there was still this gap in my life where All My Children and One Life to Live were until I heard the British coming. While surfing through the wonderful world of YouTube, I discovered something unbelievable. The British soaps. These British soaps definitely filled the void of drama that I needed in my life. As for the UK soaps, I'm most familiar with EastEnders, which has been on for 38 years, and Coronation Street, which has been around for almost 63 years. Though they had the same sort of format like the daytime soaps with no season finales, the UK soaps were shown at nighttime. When I started watching it, I found out that they pulled in like tens of millions of viewers. The holiday and anniversary episodes were insane because in the US it seemed like when it came to the holiday episodes they were to be nice and warm almost like a Hallmark movie. The anniversary episodes in the US were all about family and reflection but the holiday episodes in UK soaps have you glued to the screen and the anniversary episodes remind you why you started watching the shows in the first place. In the UK soaps, everybody doesn't come back from the dead. Sure, there are people who do come back from the quote unquote dead only because the characters weren't really dead because you didn't see their dead body. In a UK soap, if you do see a dead character's body, then they're dead, dead. But when, you know, a character comes back from the supposed dead, it's believable and rare, unlike in the US soaps where it seems like characters come back from the dead every year. Sure, the UK soaps aren't always perfect, but they don't recycle old executive producers all the time. They actually hire new showrunners to keep their soaps fresh and relevant. Realism is very important to the UK soaps. Not everyone is rich. Characters aren't trying to save the world. They don't rapidly age the kids like the US soaps do. There are really no fantasy or sci-fi elements. You experience the real life struggles that the characters face. The UK soaps have never lost their identity by exploring fantasy, but their realism is something that the UK soaps take extremely seriously. Most of all, the UK soaps honor their history. Even if the ratings in the UK aren't the same like they were before, at least the networks they're shown on still believe in the soap's success. Currently, there are technically four soaps on the air. Days of Our Lives was on NBC for the longest time, 
but it's on Peacock now and it seems to be doing well on that streaming platform. It was recently renewed for another two years, which makes things seem bright for the soap genre. General Hospital is celebrating 60 years on the air, even though the network didn't really have a TV special to celebrate those 60 years, but it doesn't seem like General Hospital is going anywhere. Bold and the Beautiful is the most watched soap in the world, where it's extremely popular overseas, and Young and the Restless is still the number one soap in daytime television. So far, it seems like the soaps are here to stay. Will it have some sort of renaissance in the near future? I can't tell you. A few years ago, Spotify had plans to make an audio soap opera with the five day a week format, but after that announcement, there was nothing. I think the BBC is planning on making a new soap opera in the UK, but there's not much information about that right now. Since I wasn't willing to wait for a new soap opera to be aired, I thought to myself, hey, God has given me a gift of writing. I feel like I know how all this whole soap stuff works. Maybe I should try writing one. Which is where In Times Like These comes in, which will premiere on Labor Day. Only God knows how big this will be, but I would appreciate a like, comment, and a subscription. Unlike popular belief, it doesn't seem like the soaps are dead. They're definitely not as strong and big like they used to be, but at this point, the soaps are live. What once had our moms, aunties, and grandmas in a chokehold continue to have loyal viewers keeping these shows alive. Despite the drama, the romance, and the twists and turns, family is still the core of these soaps. Because of family, that's what keeps viewers watching. The characters are like family to the viewers in life. So many things come and go, but as human beings, we long for something consistent in our lives. Soaps have been a constant part of the lives of millions of people. As long as the soaps are on air, the more viewers have something stable to hold on to.